we on? Yeah. Hey! <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Well, good evening, my friends. Good evening. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you're having a great week. I know some things are starting to open back up slowly, and hopefully we'll be able to get back in church soon, <clears throat> worship together, in person together, and so hopefully that's the plan. Let me open in prayer. We'll turn over to Josh as we worship the Lord together. Lord Jesus, we are thankful, uh, Lord, for tonight, thankful for another opportunity just to, uh, to gather together in our homes and wherever we may be, God, just to sing and declare your praise. Uh, Lord, it, it glorifies you. It makes you happy when your people uh, sing to you, Lord. But may we understand that it's not just our lips that need to be singing, it's our hearts. And so, God, may our hearts be in tune with you tonight. Uh, Lord, as we dig into your word in a few moments, God, I pray, Lord, that we would understand uh, who you are and who you say that we are according to your word. And so, God, may you be glorified tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a song that's supposed to be mine now. Here's the chorus. Oh, 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 you 
Sing about how good you are and how you would never let us down, God. Because you are an all faithful one, God. God, speak through Casey tonight and convict hearts tonight. And then pray. Amen. Gosh. If you have a Bible at home, hopefully you do. Uh, we're going to be in Philippians chapter. Three, Philippians chapter 3. So we started this series a few weeks ago, No Regrets, and uh, tonight is the, the end of that, and we're going to start a new series next week. Uh, but I, but I want to ask you this question, and we kind of asked this question the first week when we started this study, uh, but what are you going to regret at the end of this quarantine? Remember how we talked about how the this quarantine time, we feel like this is a time that God has given us where we can slow down, spend some more time with Him. And again, this is part of the reason this series too, where we've challenged you, spend the first 20 minutes of your day reading the scripture, spending time in prayer, spending time with Jesus Himself, uh, but also uh, memorizing scripture. Uh, also being able to just read through a book of the Bible, because again, many haven't. And that's not just teenagers, many adults haven't read through books of the Bible. They've just grabbed pieces here and there, but it's important to read through books. Um, and I, I've just been so thankful for the time because I've been able to read through, um, finish Deuteronomy during this time. I finished uh, Galatians, and then today I was able to start Joshua. And so I, I, I'm, I'm excited about the things that God's doing in me as I'm reading through books of the Bible and learning some more things. But, but what are you going to regret at the end of this quarantine? And I don't know if you remember, but when we first started this, this series, I, I kind of talked about the question that I was asked the summer of 2009 when I was interning at, at First Baptist Church in Birmingham. And the guy asked me, at the end of the summer, what are you going to regret? And, and again, I remember not being able to answer that question. I was like, what a weird question to ask on day one. But as the summer went on, I began understanding what he was asking me. He was asking me to live every moment with no regrets. Right? It taught me to be more intentional about my time. Right? And my time with the students in that church, my time with the, the adults in that church, being intentional about my personal time with the Lord. And again, that's what this quarantine is. So, so again, what will you regret at the end of quarantine? As things are opening back up now, right? Uh, we've got restaurants that are opening up slowly. You might have to go get your temperature taken, but you can go in and you can eat, right? Uh, we've got uh, other things that may be opening up, the gyms, hair salons, right? These things are going to be opening up soon. And so understand that as, as life gets to be back to somewhat normal, if normal will ever be a thing again, who knows, but moving in that direction as you're going to start hanging out with friends more. You're going to start, uh, hopefully, again, um, as Brother Colin shared Sunday, that we're hoping to, to be back together as a church on May 10th, on Mother's Day. Hopefully that's the thing, and as we're gathering more together, at the end of this thing, when you're no longer at home as much as you are, what are you going to regret? What is it that you should have done that you didn't do? So let me ask you another question. What are you doing right now in your spiritual life, what are you doing right now to be sure you don't have any regrets? Can, can you honestly say in your life right now that you are giving the best efforts to know Jesus more? Can, can you honestly say that you are giving him all of yourself, you're being intentional about Jesus, you're being intentional about his word, or are you just being intentional about being lazy, right? Stuffing our faces with food or, or watching movies, playing video games, whatever it may be. And again, eating movies, I'm not saying those things are bad. But are you giving your best to grow in Jesus? Because I, I, I do believe that Jesus allowed some of this stuff to happen so that we would slow down and know him better. Listen, we live busy lives. We're all over the place, right? Uh, most of us would say we don't have time for church because we've got all this stuff going on. I've had a busy week. Can't spend time with the word. We don't have that excuse any longer, right? I, we have the time to spend time with the Lord. It's a matter of whether you truly love him or not. Right? That's what it comes down to. 
But what are you doing now to be sure you have no regrets? So we're going to dig into some of that here in just a moment. So we'll read this passage together. Again, I hope you have your Bibles. But Philippians chapter 3, we're going to read verse 12 through 14. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already fully mature, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this passage. God, this is a familiar passage. Many of us have, have read this uh, many times in our lives. Maybe we've heard it taught, we've heard it preached many times. Uh, but God, as we look at this, maybe in a different way tonight, as we look at this passage in the eyes of having no regrets, uh, God, may we, uh, God, just come to this place is what Paul was saying. Christ Jesus has taken a hold of me. So God, take hold of us tonight. Take over our hearts, our souls, our minds, everything that we are. May it be yours tonight. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, this is a familiar passage. I don't, again, I don't know if you've you know, read through this many times or you've heard it taught, preached. Um, but we're going to look at this maybe in a different way than, than what we're used to, looking at with the idea of no regrets. But point number one tonight, I want you to understand, to live a life with no regrets requires discipline. No regrets requires discipline. Read verse 12 again. Not that I've already reached the goal or, an already, or I'm already fully mature, but I make every effort to take hold of it because also I have also been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Now, many months ago, I don't know if you remember this or not, but many months ago, we, we did this passage. We did uh, 1 through 8. Uh, we did these verses. I want you to understand that in this chapter, verse 1 through 11, it's kind of speaking of Paul's desires, it's speaking of some of Paul's accomplishments, but then it's speaking of what Paul really wants out of his life and what he wants out of his life with Jesus. Listen to verse 7 through 11. But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death assuming that I'll somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. So again, in this passage, Paul is speaking of his, of his desires, his longings to know Jesus even further, speaking of knowing him in his sufferings, knowing him in his death, knowing him in his resurrection. Now I want you to understand that in this passage, Paul understands that he is not mature. Right? If you remember back when we started this passage, we looked in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 5 and Hebrews chapter 6, talking about the spiritual immaturity of, of the Hebrew readers, right, the believers, uh, and how they they didn't have, they weren't, I guess, digging in on their own to know Christ, right? They were just leaning on everybody else and the the elementary teachings of Christ, right? They were on the milk, they were not on the solid food. Paul understands that he's he's not where God wants him to be. He understands that he is not where he wants himself to be. Listen, many of us are in that place, and and listen, it's it's healthy to see that we're not in that place because if we think that we're there. Uh, then we're living by pride, right? We're not living by who Christ has called us to be. But, but Paul understands he's not made complete, right? This word mature, and again, we've, we've talked about this in the last few weeks. We looked at Hebrews. The word mature here is meaning completeness. It's perfection. Paul understands he's not there yet, right? He has not reached perfection in Christ. He's not where he needs to be. But understand this, Paul is very much alive in the race of the Christian life. He's very much alive in the race of the Christian life. But here's the thing that we need to look at. Over and over again, Paul, uh, throughout his letters, he uses the idea of running, right? And the idea of, of athletes running in a race as a way to kind of be a picture of our relationship with Jesus and our pursuit of Christ. But I want you to understand, running a race, all right, running a race doesn't have to do necessarily with how fast you sprint, okay? It's about pacing yourself, Right? Don't you know, I came across this quote this week as a staff. We're reading through a book called Replenish by Lance Witt. And in this book, he says this, Following Jesus cannot be done at a sprint. 
You can't live life at warp speed without warping your soul. He says, I've noticed something in the life of Jesus. He never seems to be in a hurry. Understand, Paul, Paul, he's, he himself is using this idea of running the race. But again, he understands it's not a sprint, right? If we just, we just hurry and we try to be as fast as we can about this and that, right? If we do that, then again, our soul is going to be warped, right? We live in this, this busyness of life. But Paul understands that the pursuit of Jesus can't be done in a sprint. You got, you got to pace yourself, right? Paul understands, listen, Paul is battling his flesh, right? If you, uh, maybe tonight we're done, go over to Romans chapter 7 and read in Romans 7 how Paul battles his flesh. He does the things he doesn't want to do, and the things he doesn't want to do, that's the things that he does, right? Check that out in Romans chapter 7 tonight. But Paul is dealing with his flesh. He knows that he is not perfect. But here's what Paul does in this passage. And read verse 12 again. Not that I've already reached the goal, or I'm already fully mature. Again, that's Paul saying, hey, I know that I'm not there. But he says, I make every effort to take hold of it. Listen, your passage may say press on. My passage says to make every effort. Paul purposes in his heart to make every effort to attain intimacy with Christ. Again, I asked you at the beginning, can you honestly say you're giving your best efforts to know Jesus more? Right? I, I can think about uh, in my pursuit of my wife, right, wanting to know her better. I spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of effort in learning to know my wife. And understand, even today we've been married for over nine years, and even in that, I'm still learning my wife. Right? I, I'm still pursuing her. I'm still pursuing knowing her. You understand, in our relationship with Christ, it needs to be even more than that. Right? There's always something new to learn about Jesus. And Paul purposes in his heart that he's going to give his best to know Jesus more, to be inti intimate with Christ. Read verse 10 and 11 again. It says, My goal is to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Here's what Paul's saying in this, in this passage, and it's a beautiful picture. Paul does not want to be empty-handed in his face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. Listen, when Paul reaches the resurrection from the dead, when Paul is face-to-face -face with Jesus, he doesn't want to be empty-handed. He wants it to be fruitful. He wants it to be good. We just sang about how God is the king of our heart, right? And he is good. He is so good. Paul knows this. So Paul is pursuing that. If you have your Bible, flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to read verse 24 through 27. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Don't you know that the runners in a stadium all race, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way to win the prize. Now everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. However, they do it to receive a crown that will fade away. But we, a crown that will never fade away. Therefore, I do not run like one who runs aimlessly or box like one beating the air. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Here's what Paul's saying. In 1 Corinthians 9. He's pointing this idea again, running a race. He said, many, many are running. But it doesn't make any sense if you're just going to run. Right? You run to win. Right? For those of you who play sports, sure, you enjoy playing soccer, you enjoy playing basketball, whatever sport that it is that you play. But ultimately, when you come to the game, you play to win. Right? You want to win. When you are watching your sport team on TV, sure, you're cheering for cool plays, but ultimately, at the end of the game, you want them to win. You want them to win. Now listen, understand this. As Paul is writing this, he's saying, hey, we, we discipline ourselves in athletics for a crown that's going to fade away. But in the Christian race, the pursuit of Jesus, we are pursuing for ourselves a crown that will never fade away. So where should our efforts be, right? Listen, I, I can look back to uh, high school and I can look back at awards that I had gotten in athletics, right? Personal awards, 
uh, making the, the all-county team, right, being invited to this all-state basketball tournament, all these type of things. But you know what? I have no idea where any of those awards are. You know what I'm saying? Because in the eyes of everything, they're worthless. I can't take that to heaven with me. Right? But what's important is the pursuit of Christ. We crossed this quote today from a guy named Shane Pruitt, and I don't want you to miss this. Jesus does not want to be a part of your life. He wants to be your life. This is radically different. Both of those are radically different. Listen, why does Paul do this? Why does Paul discipline himself, as he's saying in, in 1 Corinthians 9, disciplining himself, beating his chest, right, into submission, right, to win the prize? Why does he do that? Because of what Philippians 3.12 tells us, that Christ has taken a hold of him. Christ got a hold of his life. Listen, that's the difference between Jesus not wanting to be a part of your life and Jesus wanting to be your life. It's the difference in whether or not you've really been taken hold of by Christ. Listen, and it's sad. Many of us think that we have it figured out. We think that we are right with Christ. We're not. We're lost. It's not just us taking a hold of Christ and understanding some things that he said. It's him taking a hold of our lives and our lives looking like his, not like the world. Listen, the more you mature in Christ, the more you realize how much further you have to go to become like Christ. Let me say that again. The more you mature in Christ, the more you realize how much further you have to go to become like Christ. This is where Paul's at in verse 12. I understand that I am not fully mature. But he says, but I press on. I make every effort to take hold of it because Christ has taken a hold of me. Why does Paul pursue Jesus? Because Jesus has pursued Paul, right? Why should we pursue Jesus? Because Jesus has pursued us. So no regrets requires discipline. It requires you and I to give our best efforts to grow in Christ. Number two, no regrets means your past doesn't define your future. No regrets means your past doesn't define your future. Verse 13 says, Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Paul understood that when you run a race, you don't need to look back, right? It's going to slow you down if you look back. You keep your eyes moving forward. I want you to think about Paul's life. When Paul says this, when he says, I'm forgetting what is behind, what is Paul forgetting? Well, one, Paul's forgetting the guilt of persecuting the church. Remember who Paul was. Right before the road to Damascus, the blinding light, and he surrendered his life to Jesus. And, and I know Brother Kylan's been preaching that if you've been paying attention and watching the, the Sunday night live streams. But understand that before Paul knew Christ, Paul killed Christians. He was very much there, very much active in the stoning of Stephen. So understand that Paul in this moment, he's forgetting that. And, and I don't know about you, but I've got sins in my life that, that I struggle to forget. Right? Things that have happened years ago. Right? And understand, when they come to my mind, it's not, it's not Christ reminding me of those things. Christ is not going to bring me back into a place of shame and guilt. It's either the, the enemy or it's myself. Understand, Paul is forgetting this. He's forgetting the guilt of persecuting the church. You and I have probably not murdered anybody. Right? But understand, in Paul's past in murdering believers. That's hard to get over. Paul forgets that. Paul forgets the pain of prison and physical punishment. Paul forgets the frustration of disobedient church members and false teachers as he continues in his ministry and making the name of Jesus famous. But don't you understand in this word forget, it doesn't mean that uh, he loses all memory of his sinful past. But he leaves it behind him, as, behind him as done and settled. Right? Christ has taken care of it. He leaves it there. He doesn't carry that with him. He leaves it at the foot of the cross. He leaves it with Jesus because Jesus has taken that sin. Understand, you and I are not defined by our past. Our past should not ever determine what our future is. Listen. I've got sins that I would be embarrassed to say out loud. You've got sins you'd be embarrassed to say out loud. We all do. We've got sins that we've said before that if someone was sitting next to us and we said it, they wouldn't want to sit next to us. Right? We've all got sins that are gross and disgusting. But Jesus still pursues us in the midst of that. 
we have to know if we've been redeemed, if Christ has taken a hold of our life, then you know what that means? We leave it behind because it's done with and settled because of what Jesus did on the cross. Listen, it's kind of like Hebrews 6, right? Some of the passages we, we highlighted a little bit in Hebrews 6, verse 4 through 6, right? If we continue in our sin, it's almost like we're crucifying Jesus over and over and over again. It's impossible to do that, right? If Christ has taken hold of our life and we've really been changed, then again, leave it behind. Your past, your sinful past, should not define and does not define your future. See, Paul knows his past. But again, he leaves it settled and done with, and he keeps his eyes fixed on Jesus. Paul knows who Jesus says he is, and he knows who he is in Christ. So Paul looked ahead to the finish line. What was the finish line for Paul? It was Jesus. He looked at Jesus. Jesus was the reward. It wasn't the pearly gates. It wasn't the streets of gold. It was Jesus. Jesus is his reward. Jesus is his goal, and he's running at him with Everything that he is, everything that he has, every ounce of energy, every effort towards knowing Christ. But can we honestly say that about ourselves? Listen, our past is holding us back. We're letting our past, we're letting something that we did yesterday, something we did months, even years ago, we're letting it define us today. Listen, if Jesus has rescued you, that's not who you are. You're chosen, you're redeemed, you're set free. And read Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2 and you will see the truth of who Jesus says that you are. So know that. No regrets means your past doesn't define your future. But number three, no regrets is a longing for Jesus above all else. No regrets is longing for Jesus above all else. Read verse 14. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ. Jesus. Listen, we, we kind of discussed this a little bit last week, but you and I pursue what our desires are. We're going to pursue what we want. Right? That's why we see so many people pursue uh, jobs, schools, uh, sports, relationships. Right? I mean, it can be a number of things that we're going to put in there, things that we pursue. Right? So the things, again, that we care about, that we love the most, those are the things that we're going to pursue with our lives. But as Paul continues again with this idea of running a race, again, as he said in 1 Corinthians 9, all runners run. Right? I don't know if you've ever been to a track meet or a race, um, but I can't think of a race I've been to where I didn't see one of the scheduled runners not run. They're going to run. But who wins? How many win? One. You got one, one winner at the end of that race. Listen, we need to not be content by just being in the race. That's where fear we are. We're content with just being in the Christian life. We're saying, hey, Christ has saved me. I got a great church. I got great Christian friends. Parents are godly. I have a Bible. I'm in the Christian life. But there's no, no intentionality about knowing Jesus at all. Because we've pursued our jobs, our schools, our sports, our relationships, so on and so forth, more than we've pursued Christ. Again, don't be content by being in the race. Run to win. Live your life to win. Live your life to know Christ. That's how you win. Listen, we win when we're in Christ. That's how we win. Listen, Paul desires Jesus far above anything else. Again, if you have time later, read verse 1 through verse 6. Paul's speaking of, of all of his accomplishments, things that I mean, he has been good at, the things that he has been rewarded in his life. And again, it gets into verse 7. He says, everything that was a gain to me, I considered a loss because of Jesus Christ. Right? He desired Jesus far above anything else. Listen, Paul wants to hear God call his name and summon him to the victory stand where he will meet Jesus face to face. That's what he's living for. The face to face encounter with Jesus Christ. Listen, earthly prizes do not last. Eternal prizes do. Earthly prizes do not last. Eternal prizes do. Listen, Paul's greatest longings are not found in this life. They're found in heaven. Why? Because Christ is there. Christ is there. He pursues wherever Christ is. 
That's why he doesn't want anything this world has to offer. Because he doesn't see Christ there. When he looks at heaven, he looks at the word, he sees Christ. That's his pursuit. Listen, if you and I were that much in love with Jesus, we would not want heaven unless Jesus was there. We need to be where Jesus is. Heaven is not glorious because it's heaven. Heaven is glorious because that's where Jesus is. It doesn't matter where Jesus is. That's where glory is. That's what Paul pursues. So may we live lives of no regrets. May we be disciplined. May we not let our past define our future. And may we long for Jesus above all else. Pursue him. Again, Paul knows he hasn't arrived. But he makes his best effort to know Jesus, forgetting the past, keeping his eyes ahead, pursuing as his goal, Christ Jesus. May that be our pursuit. May that be our goal. May we be intentional about knowing Christ. That means some things have to change in our lives. And may we know Jesus more intimately than we ever have before. That starts with you being intentional. It starts today. It's not saying, hey, let me do it tomorrow. Let me do it after the quarantine. It's now. Pursue Christ now. He's worth it. Again, it comes down to that quote as we said at the beginning. Jesus doesn't want to be a part of your life. He wants to be your life. And we find ourselves faithful to surrender all that we are to Jesus. Not just some of us, but all of us to Jesus. Let me encourage you. Continue on digging into the word first 20 minutes of your day. Memorizing scripture, reading through books of the Bible. Please share with us. Uh, send us a text. Send us a, a private message on Instagram and say, hey, uh, this is what God's teaching me through the book that I'm reading. Uh, this is the, the scripture that I'm memorizing. But maybe you've heard something we've said today and you said, you know, I've realized that Jesus is only a part of my life. I'm only giving Jesus the church times, the, G the Sundays and the Wednesdays, but I'm not giving Jesus my life. And if you feel like, hey, you need to surrender yourself fully, then please let us know. Let myself know. Let Brother Steve know. We want to walk with you and help you know who Jesus is even more. Uh, and if you're not saved, to come to saving faith and knowing Christ. This is the greatest decision you can ever make in your life. The greatest place I've ever been is in the presence of Christ. May we live in that. So please let us know if that's a decision you need to make. I want to encourage you again, as uh, Brother Colin shared Sunday, that the goal is to be back together Sunday morning, May 10th on Mother's Day. Um, still uncertain as far as some youth activities and summer camp. We're hoping to have an answer in summer camp next week. Um, but as of right now, we're still planning where we're going to go until we, uh, we have an idea next week. And so uh, we will let you know uh, yay or nay, hopefully next week, and uh, so that we can plan accordingly for camp or not camp. But if we don't do camp, we've got some things in the work to make sure that we still get a camp-type experience. And so um, be looking for that type of news as well as some other things, uh, some of the, the Bible Thursday night Bible studies may be starting up here pretty soon as well. And so I'll be looking for those as we uh, will text you, we'll post it on on here as well for you to know that. So let me pray for you, and then uh, we'll see you guys next week. Lord Jesus, we are thankful for your spirit. Thankful, Lord, for what Paul has written in Philippians 3. And so, God, I pray, Lord, that we would uh, press on to know you and that you would take hold of our lives. And, Lord, that you would not just be a part of our life, but that you would be all of our life. So work in that way, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. See you all next week.